this morning's presentation. Uh, we are all in the midst of this COVID pandemic. Uh, we are bombarded with information, which is confusing and also unnerving. Uh, viruses are an enigma. They are living, they are non-living. In fact, one can put together DNA sequences and the protein in a test tube and create a virus out of nothing. In fact, when day Stanley in 1946 got Nobel Prize working with tobacco mosaic virus. In the first lecture, I had posed a question, you might recall, uh, two plant scientists have got Nobel Prize. One was uh, working with maize, Dr. Barbara McClintock. The other was Dr. Borlaug. I had asked you to list a couple of more, and I see one on Artemisin, uh, a Chinese, uh, Yu Yu Tso. The other one is Wendley Stanley, working with tobacco mosaic virus. If you can search and connect, there will be many more. Uh, I would leave that exercise to you uh, for the future. Uh, most of the time we think viruses in negative terms, that they are useless or they cause harm. Uh, it is not so. Uh, for example, the color of tulip is because of the virus infection. If there is no virus infection, they will all be uniform color. Similarly, poinsettia, some of you might be familiar with the gardening. Poinsettias, the branching type, are because of mycoplasma. It's, a, it's another type of uh, variant. Uh, I would not call it as virus, but it's it is something similar to that. So many times these are also useful. Uh, we are also talking of transposons, retrotransposons. There are also remnants of viruses uh, hanging around. Uh, and they also influence many of our traits, uh, both in humans, animals, and plants uh, of great value sometimes. So let us consider that viruses are also useful. Uh, in fact, most of the molecular biology work uh, comes from the use of the knowledge of viruses, even including the latest genome editing. Uh, so today we have Dr. Shelley Praveen, head biochemistry of IARI, talking about the viruses. Uh, she is a graduate from Delhi University, postgraduate MSc and PhD from IARI, a very distinguished scientist with many awards. In fact, she has received the Woman Scientist Award of the ICAR and also Best Teacher Award, uh, in a sense, both in terms of research as well as in terms of teaching. She is an outstanding scientist and a teacher. Uh, she also wears two hats in the sense she has a degree in biochemistry, but has spent most of her working, active working life, even continues to, on viruses. Uh, so she has, that's how combined the two su subjects, biochemistry of viruses. Uh, I now hand over to Dr. Shelley Praveen uh, for a lecture on biochemistry of viruses. Thank you. Yours, madam. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for nice introduction and very good morning to all the participants. Today I am here to discuss a very important topic, uh, as Dr. Bhatt mentioned, that every day and night these days we are talking about viruses. We are listening all the news related to understand what actually this virus is and how it is going to have infection process and how they are different when we talk about plant viruses and animal viruses or human viruses. So I am here, as he mentioned, I am a biochemist. 
So my basic degree is in biochemistry. So I want to understand throughout last 25 years that how the biochemistry of the viruses, uh, how the genomic components and the proteins are important for infection process. Once we understand the infection process, we have various ways to control them, whether it is in the case of plants or in case of uh, animals and humans. So I am starting my uh, presentation by sharing my slides. And it's a, in next one hour, I'm planning to sh share some of the experiences uh, which I gathered during my journey of working on plant viruses. So during this one hour talk, I'm planning to convey to you a brief introduction. Most of you are aware of, you are all are involved in teaching biology. So brief introduction about viruses. And then viruses, two major components, that is viral genomes and viral proteins. And most importantly, the viral infection process and the immune responses from the host whether it is a plant as a host or human as a host. So during this third topic, I am going to cover some of the work which we are doing in our laboratories. And some part I have dedicated to this famous coronavirus. And I'm putting a disclaimer in front of all of you that I am not a human virologist or a medical virologist. But as a vi virologist working in plant viruses from more than two decades, I have interest in the to know the infection process of coronaviruses. So I gathered information from internet and I want to present before you that how the virus infect. And we all are very much interested to know because everybody is looking for remedies to how to get rid of from this viral infection. So to start with, uh, as Dr. Bhatt initially mentioned that viruses are very important. So if we go back into the history and see about the pandemics, because daily these days we are hearing about pandemics. So pandemics, we are in 2020 and the last pandemic which we have, we are witnessing is started in 20, 2019. But the history is as old as you go back to 735 when the first pandemic came and that is also caused by a virus, Japanese smallpox epidemic. And during this pandemic, the death toll was 1 million. Then after 500 years later, in 1300, there was another pandemic, this time not by virus, by but by bacteria, and it was famously known as Black Death. And that time, death toll was 200 million. Again, coming back to virus, 1520. And five, the third plague, very good. First plague, and this is caused by that Spanish flu. So roughly a, dec a, a century ago, a Spanish flu came and that is by the virus H1N1 virus and the death toll that time was 40 to 50 million. And you can also see that 10 year also, sometimes two year, one year or five years. Then we are all aware from HIV, a HIV virus we know um, from 1981 and 25 to 35 million people died. Then there are some small uh, pandemics. 
and that is in 2002 uh, corona virus uh, has started appearing this but not in that much vigor what we are seeing these days so 2002 there is a sars uh, infection and that toll was very less so that time we were not very much bothered about the corona virus then came the ebola virus and that toll was not very much again it is not taken very seriously but recently the same variant of corona virus appeared again in 2015 that toll was less that is why it was not taken very seriously now we are here so 2019 and we all are witnessing covid 19 and this data is from june to up to june 15 that death count is more is around 4 lakh 50000 so based on these why i am showing these figures the purpose is to understand that unless and until we uh, know the infection process and the cure uh, it is very heavy on human health or human life so it is important that the time when 2002 first the sars appear that time because of the less damage the importance was not given to the infection and the cures so i am now taking back to the very basic thing that when we talk about virus then concept of a virus is an organism so there is always a challenge to define life when we talk about virus you must be hearing these days that it is in between living and non living so why i am saying so because daily you must be hearing in the news that the infection process can take place if you touch anything or you touch any surface so it means the virus is there on the non living material also but it is once it gets the host it start living so if i can broadly categorize in two category that whether we will go for living or non living then if we say viruses they cannot breathe they cannot grow themselves they cannot metabolize anything we know the metabolism is a, a anabolism and catabolism is very important for any living cell and they are acellular means they do not carry all the cellular organelles which we feel is important for a cell to work so if we go by these criteria they are coming under non living category but once they reach the host cell they start replicating so now onwards they are living they have some genomic components and that is why they are able to mutate so these components make them towards the living category so if we go by this they have dna and or rna so most of the time when we are teaching we say why nature has selected dna as a genetic material and we always classify between dna and rna that dna is more stable but surprisingly most of the viruses are having rna so they can they can have dna or rna as genomic component the genomic component is surrounded by a protein because they have to carry a coat around the protein naked um, geno genomic material cannot move although there are some examples called as viroids where there is only naked rna which can also be infectious and some of the viruses they have lipoprotein outer layer so there is a lipid also involved and that is why sometimes we are saying that you wash your hands with the so so that the lipoprotein layer you can neutralize by the at higher ph and an intact virus particle we call it as virion so this is just a basic introduction about virus and coming to some pictures and the size which i want to show you that how virus look like so in most of your tv screens you are just getting the virus like this so this is the a kind of a cartoon uh, you are able to see and most of the people think that virus look like so colorful like this 
But if you see under the electron microscope, they are our various types of shapes you can see under the electron microscope. So this is famous, your coronavirus, which is causing COVID-19. Then they are having a flexuous particle or a rod-like structure. Dr. Bhatt mentioned about tobacco mosaic virus. Tobacco mosaic virus look like this, rod type structures. Then we have a bipartite twin particles like this or circular spherical shapes. So if you go by the size, if you see this small picture here, that one centimeter to one angstrom, if you move, some of the things you can see by your naked eye, then you have, if you move down to the size, you have to use light microscope. But viruses starts from here and from 10 raised to the power, say minus six onwards up to 10 raised to the power minus eight, you have to use electron microscope to see these viruses. So these all are the pictures under electron microscope. And then you can go for smaller molecules like proteins and atoms up to the angstrom level. So this picture, this graph, this scale shows that we have, if we want to see viruses, we have to use electron microscope. Now coming to the next slide, how the viral, we know that there is virus symptoms. If there is a viral infection, Uh, affected by viruses. So I am showing both type of symptoms. Like this is, we are very much familiar with. This is common flu or even coronavirus is also showing this kind of symptoms, fatigue, and then conjectivitis. Most of the, during rainy season, we are having this infection also, and the mumps. So all viral uh, symptoms are different and they cause different type of problems in our cell metabolism and that is ultimately reflected in the form of symptoms. Now coming to plants, if you see plant leaves, sometimes you can see the mosaic like this or a very beautiful mosaic like Dr. Bhatt mentioned about tulips. So breaking color in the tulip is a first indication of viral infection. But since it looks very pretty, we feel that it is a helpful infection and making our tulips pretty. So this is a leaf curling symptoms. The leaf become yellow and become curled. And if you go to the fruits, these kind of tomatoes you are able to see in the market, these are all having viral infection. And this type of papaya is also very common with so much of ring spot occurring on the papaya. So all these, those who are working in plant viruses, by seeing those symptoms, they can guess what type of viral infection it is. As the medical doctor knows, uh, when, they, uh, when he or she see these kind of symptoms. So once the virus infect, hijack the, your host cell machinery. And because of the hijacking of uh, host cell, different symptoms appears. So let's see briefly, that what type of components are present. As I said, main component is a genomic component and the cover is a code protein or the capsid protein. So these are some of the components. We know that DNA and RNA can be the genomic component, but there are so many variants also within DNA and RNA. So if you see the virus particle, the viral proteins are there outside also which we, we, I will discuss in case of coronavirus, spike proteins. And the envelope is there, code protein or capsid proteins are there. But this is not in all the cases. Basic two things are there, code protein and genomic component. And depending upon the category or the family of virus, they have capsid protein or nuclear proteins. Now, DNA, you can see DNA can be in two forms, double-stranded DNA or single-stranded DNA. So some viruses carries double-stranded DNA as the genome 
and some carry single stranded DNA as a gene. And these are different names of the family written. I'm not going into the detail, but just to classify them into based on the genomic component. Now coming to the RNA type. RNA type, you can see, I have written plus SS. This is positive sta single standard RNA. This is negative single standard RNA. And again, I have written positive single standard RNA. And I will explain why. Positive single standard RNA means positive sense. We, we use the word positive sense. Means whatever RNA which the virus contains, once it infects, the famous coronavirus also belongs to this category. Whatever RNA it contains, once it reaches the host cell, it can be translated directly into viral proteins. And these viral proteins reassemble and make the new virus. Whereas in case of negative single standard RNA, different families of viruses listed there, what happens this Negative, since it is a negative sense, it means it cannot directly code for protein. So it is to be first converted to positive sense. And this positive sense are things which ultimately makes the new virus. So from single and negative sense to positive sense, this transition takes place in host cell by using host machinery. And you must be Yesterday, you heard about RNAi. So, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase of the host cell will virus use to make this single st minus uh, stand to plus stand. Then again, there are another kind of positive single standard RNA as a genome. And retroviridae, the famous HIV virus, belongs to this category. And this type of virus, although they carry plus stand RNA, but this plus single stand RNA directly do not code for viral protein. It is but first converted by reverse transcriptase to DNA virus, DNA genome. And this DNA genome again give you RNA. And this RNA is able to give you viral proteins, which can call make new viruses. So in this kind of positive sense RNA viruses, one more step of reverse transcription required, and that is also used. About animal or human viruses. Now coming to plant viruses. Plant viruses are diverse, but not as diverse as the animal viruses. And they have different type of infection process, because if you are familiar with the difference between the animal cell and the plant cell, uh, the movement of the plant viruses required uh, through plasmodesmata and cell-to-cell -cell movement is not through the, like in human, we have different ways of uh, spreading the virus from one cell to another cell and we can have blood uh, also as a carrier to take virus from one to another place. Whereas in a plant cell, it has to go to um, it has to move from through plasma test matter. And similarly, most of the plant viruses are having positive sense, single standard RNA as a genome. And as I talked about viroids, so viroids are naked RNA and they do not even contain the code protein and they are infectious. Similarly, in plant uh, viruses, they And similarly, the same reverse transcript procedure is also there. In case of positive sense RNA, there are some certain viruses which carry multipartite genome. It's not a single genome. Two or three different components, uh, uh, they are constituting the genome. And interestingly, there are some viruses in this category where some of the strands are positive and some part of the strand is negative. So those kind of viruses is genomic component, we say MB sense. So some are positive sense, some are negative sense, and some are MB sense. Means half of the RNA can directly code for the protein, 
and rest half of the RNA is first converted into uh, the positive sense and then only it goes for the protein. So this is interesting that even though they are such a tiny components with a very, very small size of genome, but you can see the complexity in the genome so that with such a small size, they can truly hijack the cell in their favor. Now coming to the viral proteins, as I mentioned that they work with the very little uh, genome, so they can, they code for very less number of proteins. And the beauty of these viral proteins are, they are most of the time multifunctional. So they have to perform two, three functions in the cell. Uh, since the virus do not have a liberty to have one protein, one function, because of the smaller size of the genomes, so this is the beauty of uh, viral proteins. So as we all know, viral proteins, structural protein, as I was talking, which can make a structure like the uh, spike protein, membrane protein, envelope protein, coat protein. So their role is just to make a structure around the new uh, genomic component so that to safeguard this genomic component and to involve in the infection process as these spike proteins are good. Then there are some functional proteins because certain proteins which are required immediately by the virus once it enters the host cell. So once it enters the host cell, what happens that it, it has to start replicating. And if it is an RNA virus, as I mentioned, different type of viruses, then If it is an RNA virus, the RNA can be multiplied in the cytoplasm. And if it is a DNA virus, it has to go to the nucleus. And once it is replicating, the first, uh, first enzyme it requires is a leaks protein. So there are all the viruses, most of the viruses, they carry their replicase protein in their genome. And then they start multiplying. And then they have to, meanwhile, the host cell is also very important to evoke its immune response or resistance response. So virus also carry certain proteins so as they can suppress the immune response or the defense response of the host and help in the propagation of virus. So once they start replicating and making the protein of their choice using this cell machinery of the host, and they reassemble and make many more virus particles. So these are functional proteins, which the viral genome codes. Now, most of the time I'm going to spend on viral infection and immune responses, taking some of the examples from my lab and then finally by the coronavirus. So when we talk about viral infections, every in nature, what is happening that all living beings have to live. So if virus has to live, the host has to also live. So there must be some harmony. So viral infection occurs, virus wants to propagate and host wants to survive. So a constant battle is going on between the host and the virus. So if we go by the human or animal or mammalian system, we know that we are having a very good organized immune system. And this immune system, um, maybe in the afternoon you are listening more about the immunity and immune system, where uh, any infection process, if it is taking place, our immune system is geared up to make antibodies and to help in protection from these infections. Whereas in plants, there is not much well-defined immune system like this but they also carry certain system which is dependent upon the viral infection. So if I say, you must have heard about the term apoptosis or necrosis. So apoptosis is the common term when we deal with the animal cell and necrosis is the term which we use when we use the plant cell. So basically both these terms confine to cell death. So whenever virus enters in any host cell, it tries to hijack the whole 
for cell machinery so that it can multiply make its own protein so once uh, the initial response of the cell is to put its defense but if the cell is able, failing in putting the defense cell wants to go for suicide or cell death and this is what the term refer as apoptosis or necrosis so if you see in the plant system there are some necrotic lesions you can see whenever the viral infections are there so basically these lesions can uh, these area the cell belonging to this area are dying and they prevent the because of the death they prevent the spread of the virus to the neighboring cells so during this process the signal goes to the neighboring cells so that uh, the immune response or the defense response of the neighboring cells become alerted so this is how the signal transduction takes place and in plant whenever the when cell dies or having a necrotic symptom different type of hormones or uh, pathogen related proteins are induced in the remote areas to prevent viral infection so this we called as systemic acquired resistance so these portions acquire the resistance because of the signals they are receiving from those cells which are infected and they are done so now coming back to this point because as a biochemist we know that whatever virus is having is either this or this so how and host is also mainly dependent on this central take cross talk so uh, until and unless we understand this process during infection we are not able to manage these viruses so again i am taking back to the same picture uh, that whenever the viral infections are there there are several biochemical changes happening in the cell whether it is a animal cell plant cell and during this process there is a host fitness trade off which we can see in the form of symptoms and these symptoms vary from virus to virus depending upon their infection process in the cell and most common uh, category of stress is the production of reactive oxygen species in the cell and the host system is also geared up with the various antioxidant so in normal cell they are in balance but whenever these infections takes place this is much more than the antioxidant system symptoms uh, system and because of that with oxidative stress stress the rhythms of life are disturbed so starting with central dogma once again when we are talking that dna gives you rna and rna gives the protein so it is transcription translation dna replicate like this sometimes rna become reverse transcription become dna and there is rna replication also as i mentioned in case of some of the viruses where rna as in genome so at these three nodal points let's see how the host work and how the virus capture the host machinery so as we know that dna is a genetic material and last uh, week onwards you were hearing the different lectures where different traits and genes are located on this dna different chromosomes are there certain traits are linked and they are coding they are uh, they are representing certain traits but you all know that all the genes are not transcribed all the time so there is a trigger whenever the, that gene is required then only it is transcribed to rna and then it is translated to protein so there is a term i am using the term epigenome so most of the dna which is not required all the time there is a methylation or many other modification in the dna molecule takes place 
to make that viral, uh, to make that DNA component uh, not comfortable enough for transcription. So this is the epigenetic modifications which are taken in the DNA molecule and DNA is getting methylated so that it undergoes, it do not undergo transcription. So this is one level. And this, why I'm talking about this level? Because the viruses which carry DNA as a genetic material, once it enters to the uh, nucleus of the host, since it is not a desired DNA of the cell, the machinery of the nucleus finds it that it is some alien DNA is, has come and that machinery tries to put methylation over that DNA so that this is not to be transcribed. So this is first point of uh, entry or defense by the host whenever the DNA virus enters. So if DNA virus do not want this machinery to operate on viral DNA, so they try to hijack this mechanism. I will show you by example. Now coming to the second point that is RNA. So if it is a DNA virus, it will give you RNA. Or if it is a RNA virus, it has to replicate into the host cell. So if at, if it, at this point, if it is a DNA virus giving you RNA, once it reaches to the uh, cytoplasm, you must have seen in the movie yesterday that the cell ribosomes feel that this is an alien RNA. And like a cock, it wants to cleave that RNA by making it double stranded RNA. Whereas if it is a RNA virus, it has to replicate in the cytoplasm with the help of RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So with the help of RDRP, it is making double stranded RNA. And somehow once they start making double stranded RNA, then there is another trouble that RNAi machinery is evoked, which is another defense mechanism. And anything which is look like a double standard RNA, the dicer recognized it and cleaves it into a small siRNA. And these siRNA, when gathered on a risk complex, they recognize the invading viral RNA, which has a sequence similarity with this small interfering RNA and invading viral RNA is also further chewed up. So this is a second level of defense. If that this defense fails for DNA virus, the second level of defense is there. And for RNA virus, this is the first level of defense. So then viruses have to be smarter enough to pass this defense also. So that is why they code for certain protein to skip this, or to skip this. Once they skip both, then there is a third level, which is very important, protein. Because proteins are structural and functional, both for the host cell, as well as for the viruses. So we know that proteins are, protein turnover in the cell is maintained by this proteosomal complex. So this proteosomal complex is having several subunits and the functional And this protein is further chewed up in this complex. So this is basically working as a dustbin of the cell for all those protein which are not useful in the cell. So when viral proteins are present in abundance and when they start multiplying, this is geared up and the, the concept is that they may be uh, chewed up in this proteosomal complex. So there are three levels of defense which the host wants to put. And all the three levels, the virus has to evade. So I will give you one by one, three examples, and let's see how viral proteins infringe cellular metabolism. Or I told you that virus code very few proteins and they are multifunctional. So I am taking one example on which my lab has worked extensively that is on tomato leaf curl virus. So I told you 
that the name indicate curling of leaf. So curling of the leaf is like this. Sometimes it is also yellowing of the leaf beside curling. So once the curling of the leaf is there, the photosynthetic efficiency reduces and once yellowing also occurs and ultimately the growth of the plant is affected, plant become very stunted and it is a, a, a major yield loss in tomato because of this virus worldwide. So this is belonging to Gemini Uridi and you can see the twin particle. Okay. It sports for eight to 10 proteins. And you can see wonderfully how the genes are packaged on this genome. There are overlapping ORFs also and embedded ORF also. It, this is one gene, AC1. And there is within one, that gene, there is another ORF, AC4. So such a small genome is packed with so many genes and they are very small proteins and they have various multifunction in the host cell. So I'm not going into the details of the experiment, but just I will show you how the viral protein hijacks at three level. So whenever virus propagate and affect the host, so this is a tomato plant, and this is tomato leaf curl virus, when they, uh, there is an infection, they start coexisting in the host. And once they start coexisting, viral proteins are formed in the cell and their main intention is to infringe host defense. Whereas viral uh, host proteins are also uh, uh, is synthesized in the cell and their main function is to provide defense. So this is a defense, this is a counter defense and both are running with time. So if this counter defense is strong, there is infection and there is a host fitness trade-off. But if the defense is strong, we have resistance developed. That is why some of the genes codes for resistance and some of the genetic material which is resistant, we are using as in a breed, as an inbreeding. Now coming again back to central dogma, when I am talking about these three steps. So I am taking you to this tomato leaf curl virus, which is basically a DNA virus. So it has to take care of this phenomena also, because the genome of the tomato leaf curl virus has to replicate in the nucleus. And this virus has to escape this epigenome mechanism of the cell. Secondly, once the transcript which are formed and they come to the cytoplasm and then there is a threat by the RNAi machinery so that it has to escape that also. So a tiny 170 amino acid protein which uh, I mentioned as AC4 if you recall a small protein code by virus and this is 178 amino acid protein. Imagine the size Imagine the gene size doing two jobs. It has to protect its DNA from epigen epigenetics and it has to protect RNA by RNAi. So what we did, we wanted to know how exactly this protein is doing two wonderful jobs. So we labeled this protein with green fluorescent protein. And when we inoculate it into the plant cell, uh, plant leaf, and under the confocal microscopy, you can see that where exactly in which organelle of the cell this protein is going. And from these images, you can understand that what exactly may be the role of this viral protein during infection process. So when we did this exercise, we found that it is throughout scattered in all the cytoplasm. And this is a nucleus, this is a nucleus, and you can see the new, uh, why, uh, how we can know that this is a nucleus, because we are using another marker, 
which is this red color marker you can see. So this is a red fluorescent protein and nucleolus targeting. So wherever the red dots are there, those are all nucleus. So this is just to locate nucleus in the cell. And this uh, AC4, which is labeled with green fluorescent protein, you can see it is at the boundary of all the nucleus. So it is also in cytoplasm and it is also aggregating along the nucleus. So with this observation, it must be doing something. It is not inside, present inside the nucleus, but it is doing job around the nucleus. So we investigate. And then as I, that the genome, epigenome is formed based on the machinery, which is present in the nucleus. And this is RNA dependent DNA methylation is one of the concept. So uh, RNA dependent means whatever this DNA transcribing to RNA, and if that RNA is not required enough in the cell, this become double standard RNA, then it is moving to the small RNAs and these small RNAs are loaded into the ergonaut core protein. And then it goes to this methylation machinery and try in a sequence specific manner, it start methylating the DNA by giving a message that no more RNA is required for this gene. So this is a normal process taking place in a normal host cell. So any gene which is not to be required for drug, then this process is happening in the cell. And same way, the viral DNA when enter and it has undergone this kind of a process, then viral RNAs are formed and this goes to this methylation machinery and viral DNA gets methylated. So now virus wants to prevent this because it do not want its DNA to be methylated. So this ergonaut core protein is synthesized in the cytoplasm and it has to go to the nucleus and then do perform this job. So what this small viral protein is doing, this small viral protein binds with this ergonaut core protein and prevents its entry to this nucleus because it wants to save its own DNA. But while doing so, it is also hampering the epigenetic mechanism of other DNA, host DNA also. And that is how it is creating aberrations and a puckering or leaf curling symptoms appear because the epigenetic controls is lost. So you just see a small protein is not able to do anything. What it do, it does, it binds with this and resists the entry into the nucleus. So this is one way it is protecting its DNA. This protecting since it is also present in the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm also, it is preventing this machinery by binding with small RNAs. So you just see a protein which can bind to this, a protein which can bind to this to prevent this machinery and to prevent this machine. Now I am taking you to another virus, which is RNA virus. And this is positive sense, single standard RNA virus. We call it papaya ring spot virus, where you have seen the symptom in the fruit also, in the leaf, this, this kind of symptoms are there. And under microscope, this kind of flexuous particles are there. And it is spread by aphids. And this is a polyprotein strategy it has. It has a long RNA, positive sense RNA. The positive sense RNA gives you a positive full protein. And later it is to be cleaved by this protease to make functional viral proteins. So again, the virus proteins also affect the same way I am coming and that how the viral proteins prevent the viral uh, uh, come, 
Bosch defense by this central dogma. So again, one of the viral protein, uh, which I showed by the red color, HC pro helper component protease. Its job in this uh, viral genome, uh, viral protein is protease. Protease means it has to cleave this polyprotein into several viral proteins for their functional purposes. So it has a job of a protease, but at the same time, it is multifunctional and it has a job to prevent RNAi and to hamper the function of proteasome. Since it is a RNA virus, so it is not much bothered about the DNA and the epigenome. So it is bothering here and here. So let's see how the, they coexist. Uh, Sorry, there is some duplication of slide. Uh, yes. So same way, uh, as I mentioned uh, before, that HC Pro, the same way we labeled it with green fluorescent protein, and we wanted to know by confocal microscopy using lasers that where exactly this protein is going. And when we see it is in the cytoplasm, it is filled in the nucleus. So it is still a mystery for us since it is a RNA virus and it has nothing to do with the DNA epigenome. But why it is going to the nucleus, we are not able to solve this mystery still. And it is having, it is also going to endoplasmic reticulum. So we do not know all the functions, but we know only two functions by experiments. The first one is RNAi, the, as it is a RNA virus, so it has to replicate here, positive sense RNA. So double standard RNA is formed. And once it is formed, it has to face the RNA machinery of the host. So HC pro protein again binds with the small RNA and prevents this RNA. At the same time, if you see the proteosomal complex, where so many proteins are present, there is several subunit. And one of the subunit is having a RNAs function. That is very important to mention here. Generally, we say that proteosomal complex is only to take care of the proteins to be cleaved. But if something is escaped from RNAi, some RNA is escaped from RNAi, there is one subunit present in the proteosome also which is having an RNAs function. And this subunit will take care of that RNA and cleave it. So RNA viruses have to be careful here and they have to be careful with this subunit of proteasome also. So this is how the HC pro protein binds with subunit, this one, and prevents the function of this proteasome. Similarly, it also binds with small RNA and prevents the function of this RNA I. So this is, I'm not going into the detail, uh, but just to show you that if you, uh, this is a normal papaya plant, and if you shut down the proteosomal machinery by some chemical inhibitor, there is a chemical in inhibitor called as MG132. So if you spray this on the papaya leaf, temporarily the proteasome machinery is shut down. And once it is shut down, then virus can infect better. So that suggests that uh, proteasomal machinery of the host is providing a defense. Once you close it, the virus is very happily propagating in the host. So similar experiment we did with the viral protein, HC pro. So once we sprayed this protein, we also found that this proteasomal machinery is shut down. So basically, this viral protein binds with the one of the subunit and is responsible for the shutting down of proteasome temporarily so that virus can propagate in the cell. So you just see how intelligently one protein is doing multiple job to infringe the defense. Now, this is how we proved it. 
as I mentioned, that HC Pro start binding with this small RNA. This is by JLSA, we proved it. And this is again by another technique using confocal, which we say BIFC, uh, bimolecular fluorescent complementation assay. In this technique, what we do, if we want to show that it is binding with one of the subunit of proteasome, you label this fluorescent, split the Uh, yellow fluorescent protein, green fluorescent protein. What you do, you split green fluorescent protein into two half. One half you clone it with this cell, uh, this uh, gene, and one half you clone it with your viral gene. If they come together and interact with each other, we are able to see the fluorescence. If they do not, then we are not able to see the fluorescence. So this is how we establish that once we use the split fluorescent protein, we found that it is interacting with one of the subunit of this proteasomal complex. We also develop certain mutants and one of the mutant is not showing any fluorescence. That means this position of this viral protein is very crucial for this interaction. So this is how uh, uh, this we have shown. And interestingly, when I mentioned there is a RNA's uh, uh, subunit in the proteasomal complex, so directly this viral protein is not binding with this, but it is binding with another uh, uh, complex which is very near to this, and in turn it is affecting this ability of this uh, RNA subunit. So this viral protein binds with this path. So this is what you can see it here. And one of the mutant, which is at a crucial position, is losing this interaction. So from this experiment, you can say that how they can interact with different components of viral cell, host cell, and they will divert their functions. Now, this is the third example I'm taking, another uh, RNA virus. And in this RNA virus, uh, again, RNA virus is mostly because of, uh, they have to take care of RNAi as a defense. And there is also a necrosis. I mentioned in the initial slide how the necrotic spots appear on the plant leaf. So this is a very interesting example because it is a RNA virus with three genomic components. We can say large, medium, and small. And it is a MB-sense tripartite RNA. MB-sense means you can see some places positive sense, some places negative sense. So half of the genome can directly give you a protein. Half has to first convert to positive sense and then only it gives you a viral protein. So this is under Tosco viruses. And you can see the symptoms on the fruit like this. And this is one virus which is killing the host. So here I want to mention in nature, Virus don't want to kill its host. Why? Because they have to survive in the host cell. If host will die, virus will die. So basically, viral, most of the viruses, they don't want to kill. They want to just sustain in the host cell. But this is one example of plant viruses which kills the host. So that is uh, what I want to, uh, this experiment, what we did here, uh, that this is what the necrotic symptom. So if you inoculate the virus on the plant, you can see the symptoms like this, initially chlorotic, and then they become necrotic. So once the cells are dying here, they are sending signals to the upper leaf. And these are upper leaves. These are the leaves where we inoculated the virus. So this is the type of symptoms you are seeing here. But the upper leaves where the signal is passed, that, okay, the virus is coming and be ready with your defense. So with this signal transduction, upper leaves are geared up and they don't want to die the same death. But because of the signals they are getting, the, there is an early uh, sense or early aging takes place. And the upper leaves die like this and the local leaf die like this. We did several experiments to prove that how the upper leaf die and how the lower leaf die. So I'm not going into detail, 
but this is the slide shows that i i don't know you are able to read it or not but these are the biochemical changes which are happening this we have proved that how they are changing in the leaves where the virus is inoculated and what signals they are sending it to the upper leaves and this is due to signal transmission the upper leaves there is a alarming defense coming come, coming out and this is not able to sustain for a long but it is not dying the same death it is going for early age so this is early aging symptoms and necrosis we have proved by this so one of the viral protein it is going to the vacuoles so generally you know once you are teaching uh, biology in your classes various organelles you are teaching and there is a role of vacuole also so vacuole has various storage functions but it has a function during cell death also during cell death when this cell is aged or this cell has to die due to aging or due to infection what happens that several proteases which are in the inactive form are present in this vacuole and once cell has to die this vacuole burst and all those proteases enter into the cytoplasm and try to cleave all the protein which are present here so we wanted to prove that whenever this tospo virus infect what is actually happening in the vacuole so same way we tried several viral protein and we found that one of the viral protein this nss is going to the vacuoles the same way we labeled it and do the confocal microscopy and we labeled with gfp and using the markers uh, organelle specific marker we found it is going to vacuole and once it is there it is initiating various vacuolar processing enzymes and once they are pro their their levels are high they they uh, there is a burst of vacuole and cell death takes place so this is how the tospo virus is involved in necrotic function and since it is a rna virus it has to take care of rna i also as i mentioned so in rna i uh, this is a very simple example which we do to prove rna i so i hope we you all know about rna i any alien gene any alien transcript which the cytoplasm uh, undergoes and the cop recognizes yesterday i think uh, dr shrinivasan must have shown you a movie where the dicers are there which recognizes anything unwanted so anything unwanted uh, is converted to double stranded rna then the dicer act on it so what this experiment does basically this is a green fluorescent protein if we agro inoculate in one half of the leaf so green fluorescent protein is a protein which we have isolated from a jellyfish so it is not the native of any plant so for plant it is a alien protein so whenever the gene coding for this protein is injected in this half the rnai of the this leaf is getting alerted and this gfp expression is not much you can see a very weak expression of gfp but if the same gfp we will mix with the viral protein now viral if this viral protein is affecting and uh, hampering into the rnai machinery of the cell we can see this gfp much brighter as compared to this so alone gfp is not that fluorescent because of the defense mechanism in the form of rnai from the host but if you mix it with the viral protein if you are getting this picture that clearly shows that this viral protein is a rnai suppressor it suppress rnai machine so similarly we did this and we developed several mutant to prove which part of this protein is responsible to the do the suppression of rna so this is gel infiltration assay agro inoculation patch assay we used to do it to screen any protein whether it has a function of rna or not so this is i am again coming back to so this is a 
picture I want to show you that how it is doing the function of RNAi suppressor. Now I am coming to my last part of uh, uh, the presentation today. And uh, this is the famous So I developed this figure myself by reading the literature and uh, I want to show you a small movie of seven minutes and after seeing that movie, we will come back to this slide again. So let's see the infection process through this movie and we will see the role of different viral proteins. This is SARS-CoV-2. It belongs to the family of coronaviruses named for the crown-like spikes on their surfaces. SARS-CoV-2 can cause COVID-19, a contagious viral infection that attacks primarily your throat and lungs. What actually happens in your body when you contract the coronavirus? What exactly causes your body to develop pneumonia? And how would a vaccine work? The coronavirus must infect living cells in order to reproduce. Let's have a closer look. Inside the virus, genetic material contains the information to make more copies of itself. A protein shell provides a hard protective enclosure for the genetic material as the virus travels between the people it infects. An outer envelope allows the virus to infect cells by merging with the cell's outer membrane. Projecting from the envelope are spikes of protein molecules. Both a typical influenza virus and the new coronavirus use their spikes like a key to get inside a cell in your body, where it takes over the cell's internal machinery, repurposing it to build the components of new viruses. When an infected person talks, coughs, or sneezes, Droplets carrying the virus may land in your mouth or nose and then move into your lungs. Virus comes with cells in your throat, nose, or lungs. One spike on the virus inserts into a receptor molecule on your healthy cell membrane like a key in a lock. This action allows the virus to get inside your cell. A typical flu virus would travel inside a sac made from your cell membrane to your cell's nucleus that houses all its genetic material. The coronavirus, on the other hand, doesn't need to enter the host cell nucleus. It can directly access parts of the host cell called ribosomes. Ribosomes use genetic information from the virus to make viral proteins, such as the spikes on the virus's surface. A packaging structure in your cell then carries the spikes in vesicles which merge with your cell's outer layer, the cell membrane. All the parts needed to create a new virus gather just beneath your cell's membrane. Then a new virus begins to bud off from the cell's membrane. Now, with the virus spreading in your body, how can you develop pneumonia symptoms? For this, we'll have to look into your lungs. Each lung has separate sections called lobes. Normally, as you breathe, air moves freely through your trachea or windpipe, then through large tubes called bronchi, through smaller tubes called bronchioles, and finally into tiny sacs called alveoli. Your airways and alveoli are flexible and springy. When you breathe in, each air sac inflates like a small balloon. And when you exhale, the sacs deflate. Small blood vessels called capillaries surround your alveoli. Oxygen from the air you breathe 
passes into your capillaries and then carbon dioxide from your body passes out of your capillaries into your alveoli so that your lungs can get rid of it when you exhale. Your airways catch most germs in the mucus that lines your trachea, bronchi and bronchioles. In a healthy body, hair-like cilia lining the tubes constantly push the mucus and germs out of your airways where you might expel them by coughing. Normally, cells of your immune system attack viruses and germs that make it past your mucus and cilia and enter your alveoli. However, if your immune system is weakened, like in the case of a coronavirus infection, the virus can overwhelm your immune cells and your bronchioles and alveoli become inflamed as your immune system attacks the multiplying viruses. The inflammation can cause your alveolus many areas of both lungs. Pneumonia may cause difficulty breathing, chest pain, coughing, fever and chills, confusion, headache, muscle pain and fatigue. It can also lead to more serious complications. Respiratory failure occurs when your breathing becomes so difficult that you need a machine called a ventilator to help you breathe. These are the machines that save lives and that medical device companies currently ramp up production for. Whether you would develop these symptoms depends on a lot of factors, such as your age and whether you already have an existing condition. While this all sounds scary, the push to develop a coronavirus vaccine is moving at high speed. Studies of other coronaviruses led most researchers to assume that people who have recovered from a SARS-CoV-2 infection could be protected from reinfection for a period of time. But that assumption needs to be backed by empirical evidence and some studies suggest otherwise. There are several different approaches for a potential vaccine against the coronavirus. The basic idea is that you would get a shot that contains faint versions of the virus. The vaccine would expose your body to a version of the virus that is too weak to cause infection, but just strong enough to stimulate an immune response. Within a few weeks, cells in your immune system would make markers called antibodies, which would be specific for only the coronavirus or specifically its spike protein. Antibodies then attach to the virus and prevent it from attaching to your cells. Your immune system then responds to signals from the antibodies by consuming and destroying the clumps of viruses. If you then catch the real virus at a later stage, your body would recognize it and destroy it. In other words, your immune system is now primed. Collecting evidence on whether this will be possible, safe and effective is part of what's taking researchers so long to develop a vaccine. It's a race against time to develop a vaccine amid a pandemic. Each step in vaccine development usually takes months, if not years. An Ebola vaccine broke records by being ready in five years. The hope here is to develop one for the new coronavirus in a record-breaking 12 to 18 months. While all this will take time, stay home if you can to protect the most vulnerable. And don't forget to wash your hands for at least 20 seconds and as often as possible. This video was a collaboration between Nucleus Medical Media and the What If channel, where we usually dive into hypothetical scenarios about the human body, humanity, our planet, and the cosmos. Hello and welcome to Med Simplified. Is a basic defense. So after this movie, you are able to understand the infection process of coronavirus. Now, coming back to this slide again, I want to give you some finer details of this virus. And there is a lot of view and cry that this is a man-created virus or a natural variant. Still, there are so much debate going on. So I'm not going to comment upon that point, but I want to draw your attention to some of the points of infection. So we all know there are several points coming out that this virus jumped from one species to another and originally it may be from bat and then there is some mixture of viruses from bat and pig and ultimately it landed to human being. 
but I want to, as a biochemist, I want to give you some foresight that what happens and how it happens. So this is a coronavirus uh, cartoon you can see and the spike proteins, which I mentioned that, and you have seen in the movie also, that these spike proteins have like a, a key which can help this virus to enter into the host cell. So this uh, spike protein subunit and which we call as subunit one and subunit two. And these subunits, there is a junction between these subunits. So basically this is like a, a, a non-functional protein if both the subunits are there. And it is to be cleaved from here so that it becomes functional. So there is some human serine proteases which are extracellular and they are present around the cell. And Madam, excuse me, uh, Shelly. Hello. Your your uh, your slides are not visible. Presentation is not visible. Slides are slides. not. Yeah, we are seeing some immune system. Some old uh, this one. Okay. Video. Okay. Not... Okay. Okay. I'm coming back to this. I. I. I... Yeah. Yeah. Now it is okay. It is okay. You got. Ah, yeah. Fine. Okay. So again, I'm. I'll show you certain things. So this is a cartoon of a uh, coronavirus, and these are spike proteins. And these spike proteins act like a key to enter uh, through this lock to the inside the host cell. And this. Once both subunits are present, the virus is not able to enter because it is requiring the, the cleavage at this point so that S1 is released. And this S2 is having certain sequences which are just opening the key of this receptor which is sitting on the human cell. And this is to be cleaved by human serine protease. So human serine proteases are the enzymes which are present extracellularly and their main function in a normal cell is to, to help in the entry of certain proteins inside the cell which are present in an inactive form. So they cleave it and make it active and then they enter into the cell. So they are normally present in the system. Now what happens to make this virus active it is to be cleaved here. So original SARS virus, where I have shown in the form of endemic in 2005 or so, the sequence which is to be cleaved by human serine protease was not there in the bad viruses. So they cannot be cleaved. The, this particular sequence is required. This RRAR -R at this junction. If this is this uh, junction, this uh, amino acids are present, then only human serine protease cut into two pieces and make it active. Once it is active, it should have this sequence, this amino acid sequence, which is acting like a key and bind to this human ACE2, which is a receptor at the human cell. Once it recognizes, then this receptor help the entry of the virus into the host. So two important sequences are to be there. One, this sequence, which is required to cleave between S1 and S2. Another, this sequence, which is required to enter through this lock. Now, earlier, the whatever genomes are there, these two sequences were not there. Whether they are created by uh, this is a man-made or by mutation they are developed, uh, nobody knows at the moment. But these are two new entries into the genome of this uh, coronavirus, which leads to these spike protein like this. Now, one more interesting thing I want to tell you, because RRAR is the amino acid required for serine protease. I have also mentioned one proline. So, in before this site, one proline is also there. And what is the role of proline? You all know whenever the proline is there in the protein, it creates a bend. 
So this protein is present at the bend. And what makes this spike protein once it is cleaved makes a bend so that it will shield the epitopes and act as an immunosuppressor. So it shields the spike protein to be cashed up by the antibodies. So this is how a proline is also placed before the site to create a band so that the spike protein are not caught by the antibodies. So this is just three interesting feature I want to show you. Proline band, the uh, catalytic site for this serine protease and the recognition site which required for the receptor. So uh, this is basically happens and this is phase one of the entry. Means when the virus try to approach the cell and enter into the cell. Since there is no vaccine available, so whatever people are talking is based on remedies or based on drugs. So somehow if this process using different drugs, like uh, hydroxychloroquine also is in news and uh, India is doing pretty well by giving this medicine to many countries, but still debate is going on. Every quarter, every fortnight, you must be hearing from WHO. Sometimes and so on, still is going on. But basically, if HCQ is only a preventive step, it changes the environmental condition here and it helps in preventing the entry only. It is not binding with any viral protein or not involved in any other thing. Just across the cell membrane, it is changing the cellular conditions and because of those conditions, it hampers in the entry. Still mechanism is not known. So HCQ is one of them or you can use the inhibitor of this. But once you start using inhibitor of this, you are hampering the ability of various other protein into the cell. So this is not a very good idea to hamper this serine protease. The other strategy what people have trying is a soluble ACE. So there are certain receptor ACE2 which are on the surface of the membrane. But there are also some soluble ACEs which are extracellular and not present on this membrane. So if they are in abundance, the virus spike protein binds to those and there is ultimately no entry. So this is another approach to prevent the entry. So this is at the phase one. At the phase two, once the virus is inside the cell, as I told you, it is a positive sense RNA virus. It has to do two jobs. First, it is translating into a polyprotein. And these polyprotein is to be chopped into smaller protein by a protease. So virus also carry one protease called MPRO. So the, this MPRO is making these protein functional and ma various mature viral proteins are formed. At the same time, viral RNA replicates using RNA dependent RNA polymerase and many copies of RNAs are generated. And be because of this genetic material and because of various viral proteins, they assemble and makes new virion particles. So this is phase two. So if we are not able to prevent phase one, we have to prevent phase two. So there are several medicines. Remdesivir is one of them. You must be hearing in the news. Uh, uh, Gilead is a company, US-based company, who has come up with the remdesivir, which is blocking this process. And there are certain inhibitors which can inhibit this protease so that the mature viral proteins cannot be formed. So these are the possible drugs which are being used at the moment to prevent phase one and phase two. So based on the literature uh, available, in, I developed this diagram to make, you, uh, make it simpler so that you can understand the infection process. So coming to my last slide, as we all are very worried and we all are confined to our lockdown periods, it is important to know what actually is happening. Uh, if there is a, what is the chain of infection? So chain of infection, there are six links. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six. And these six links are the chain of reaction. And we have to break those links. If we are able to break this chain, we are able to break the infection. And that is what I will explain it. 
so first uh, chain which is here which is a microorganism so this is our coronavirus at the moment i am taking an example and then reservoir so we all those are infected with coronavirus are the reservoir or it may be animals or it may be many species at a time can be infected with that virus so that is the reservoir now from this reservoir there must be some port of exist exit some viruses have to come out from that reservoir there is some mechanism so we all know that by touch by sneezing and by this drops this is coming out from our body and once it is coming out there must be some mode of transmission from one person to another person so there must be a transmission method whether you touch something you come in contact with somebody then there is a port of entry port of entry we all know that at the moment everybody is saying come with mask so you know through your nose and your through mouth some people are claiming even through your eyes it can enter into your ent process and once there is a port of entry you are a susceptible host and this cycle will go on and on if this kind of all six material in the chain is going on so that is how i am just this is a reservoir this this is infectious process we cannot stop reservoir we can contain that is why all our governments are working on quarantine this is a port of entry we all are saying that we cannot sneeze in open we have to be with mask then this is a time we are saying that these are the possible mode of transmission so don't touch anything wear gloves wear mask and if you can break at this point you cannot be a susceptible host so this is what chain of infection occurs in every infection i am just taking an example of coronavirus so that you must be very familiar with these days that is why it is easy to understand so with this slide i am now coming to end of my presentation and during the long presentation of these many slides you must be thinking you have some take home messages and some queries which i listed maybe many more you want to ask and i am trying i will try to answer your queries the message first message is viruses live in a host they do not have their own cell so naturally they do not want to kill host as their survival depends on the host survival so please see that whenever you have a viral infection earlier whenever we have a viral infection or a flu we always feel whether you have some medicine or not it will have a viral cycle and maybe within one week or maybe within 15 days we will be recovered so viruses generally don't kill host and there is always a innate innate immunity this immunity is basically genetically governed and you inherit from your parents and there is a defense of the host which you can build yourself also in case of plant there are resistant genes in case of human we all are talking about good immune response by taking good diet they are the important barriers and they can stop infection so these are the messages which we can take so innate immunity is not in our hand this is a inherited trait but this is in our hand to immune response to boost immune response by having good diet now coming to i queries you must be having at the moment i in my introductory slide i told you about many pandemics so 725 onwards till 2020 that the question is how do pandemic get over because we all are eagerly waiting that covid 19 should be over so how do they get over the other query may be can viruses jump from species as i have given you example that may be through bat or through pig how this corona virus by changing sequences move from here to there are we going to get infection if we eat virus infected tomato or papaya so i have shown you the pictures of tomato when the tosco virus infection is there what type of tomato it look like and the papaya ring spot on the papaya so whether if we start we are eating 
whatever we are eating these days, whether we will get infection because of that. And this is really very, very important. And we all have to think very wisely on this concept that our host virus systems are co-evolving. And that is very important to understand. Whenever the virus is there, virus definitely don't want to kill the host. So sometimes we say this virus is more virulent or as the time pass, more virulent strains will come. But in my opinion and in my working with viruses, I always feel when the virus feel that it is harming the host and the hosts are killing, then the, the lighter versions or the small and the less virulent versions are evolved and that is what the concept of vaccine is that maybe certain people are uh, recovered from viral infection we are seeing that worldwide there is a lot of people which has recovered from this infection two possibilities are there maybe they have a milder uh, version of this virus or their immunity is stronger enough to take care of the virulent version so whenever the virus and host coexist together, there are chances of co-evolution. Virus wants to stay in host, host wants to defend itself, and this will go on and on. So this is a, these are some queries. And thank you very much for your patient care. Thank wait. you, madam. Uh, there are quite a lot of queries. Hello. Ah, yes, please. I'm. Uh, I I, just, uh. I'll I'll uh, go through one by one uh, oh. so that you can answer uh, uh, as you like. Uh, there are lots of questions on Corona, which I am keeping at at the end. Okay. Uh, but first things first. Uh, there is a question which we have left for them to ponder. But I overrule and ask you to answer because the vir virus infected plants are they toxic to humans? Because you had kept it for pondering because I don't want them to ponder. Okay. Uh, you clear that in the first place okay. uh, because you are a, a plant virologist. So we should give them a clear answer for that. Oh, sure. Let, me answer. Let me answer this question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please. So, yes, I put it in my last slide, but since you have asked, I want to answer. My answer is that daily you are eating plant viruses. Daily you are eating your plant viruses and you are not infected with papaya ring spot virus or tomato spotted wind virus. Why? Because in one of my slides, I told you that their mode of infection and their mode of transmission and their mode of movement within from one cell to cell are different. Plant cells are different and human cells are different. So their mechanisms are different. Plant cells, uh, that there is a movement through plasmodes meta. So infection process is totally different. So there is no harm if you are, we are eating daily. I, the many times once you are going to the market and getting this kind of tomato, you are not imagining that this tomato is having a lot of virus, but daily you are eating those tomatoes. So don't worry, plant viruses are not going to jump to human or animal system. At the moment, I can say, nothing is in, impossible in the world of science. But as, as uh, science goes, until date, the experience of different virologists across the world, there are no reports that it will enter, it will start infection in you. Okay. Uh one of the basic uh, questions uh, is you have to re-clarify uh, what makes a single-stranded RNA positive or negative? Okay. okay. The, the fundamental. Okay. How do you say that it's a positive? Okay. How do you say it's a negative when it's a single-stranded? Okay. So let me answer this. Uh, yes, it is a very important question, very basic question, but very important to understand. So we all know, you forget about virus. You must understand the central dogma. We know that genetic material is a double-stranded DNA. One of the strands of DNA is a coding strand. 
that goes to transcription and gives you a RNA, which is five prime to three prime. And this is undergone through ribosome, makes a translation and proteins are formed. So at the moment when we are talking in the cell, we are not talking about anything negative strand. We talk about always uh, whatever comes for transcription is a positive strand. Positive strand we will use more commonly when we talk about viruses. Why? Because this strand directly gives you, uh, once undergo through ribosomal process, it will start giving you protein. But if it is a single stranded RNA and it undergoes through ribosomal process, but not recognized and not having a codons which can be easily translated, you know that codons are required. In a, if you see the protein synthesis pathway from a that are missing, ribosome don't work. So similarly, the negative strand RNA does not have, but their complementary strand, which is a positive strand, carries those information, and that is how they are differentiated. So negative strand RNA is not directly be recognized for the ribosomal translations, whereas it is converted to uh, the complementary sequence, and then it becomes positive strand, and then only it will give you a mature proteins. Uh, okay. Uh, in the sense, I have a, a supplementary. In the sense, okay. Uh, okay. it it might oh, still so be confusing to them. Uh, yeah. From the point of view of how do you identify whether it is a positive strand or a negative strand given a sequence? Okay, okay. Given a sequence. Okay. Given, given a circle, it is a, mm -hmm. a circular RNA molecule or even linear. How do you say mm -hmm. that it's a positive strand or a negative strand? You, okay. you can explain in the context of sense that, and anti sense. Okay. Maybe that they are more familiar. I yeah, yeah. That is uh, indirectly, I told you in the, my first uh, half of the answer. The point is when we look for ORF, open reading frames, these open reading frames are nothing but the initiation codon, which codes for, say, methionine followed by certain other codons, uh, which look uh, go for another incorporation of separate uh, protein, uh, sep is, uh, different amino acids, and then so on, a protein chain is built. So if you have a sequence of RNA with you, and you start looking for uh, an open reading frame, if you are able to see that open reading frame, you can say that it can give you a protein. But if you are not able to see an open reading frame in that, you just convert it to a complementary strand and try to look for ORFs. And if you are able to get the ORF in the complementary strand, then uh, it is a negative sense, which is converted to positive sense. Okay. Uh, which viruses mutate faster? Is it RNA virus or DNA virus? And a couple of questions around muta mutation. What mutagens help to help the viruses to mutate? Do external conditions like temperature, moisture contribute to mutation of viruses? It's all about mutations. Very, very good question. Very good question. Uh, definitely viruses mutate and must, once we are talking about mutation, we always think of DNA in mind. Whenever we talk about mutation in plant or anything, we think that DNA is the genetic material and if it mutates, the trait is affected. But interestingly, in uh, viruses, the RNA viruses mutate much faster than DNA viruses. DNA viruses are more stable than RNA. You are not audible. You are not audible. Say again. It's not muted. No, no. Hello? It's ah, breaking. Okay. breaking. Okay. So again, I'm telling you, whenever we talk about mutation in any plant or human system, we talk about DNA. Uh, but in case of viruses, DNA viruses mutate much lesser speed than the RNA virus. And that is really a very interesting fact. RNA viruses has to mutate for their survival. 
because every time and same one virus is not going to one host it has to go to many host and once it is going to many host it has to evade their defense mechanisms and for doing so they have to mutate their viral protein in accordance to that host so they mutate very fast coming to the mutagenesis agent which which can mutate virus as it is don't, we cannot separate the human or the viral dna dna is dna or rna is rna they can be mutated the various ways as the dna component of human or plant can be mutated but at the same time there is during replication process sometimes this is not error free process whenever they replicate into a second strand or dna is converted to dna is replicated this is not full proof uh, uh, replication process sometimes there are errors and that errors also leads to recombination and sometimes two viruses infect together and during their replication process there is a recombination between the two genetic material and which give rise to a new uh, variant of that virus so that is another way of uh, vari getting variation and coming to temperatures and all those things which you are talking uh, temperature whatever you say is damaging the dna and rna the same way in any of your cell it's not the virus are special the only difference is that once the dna or rna of the virus is intact intact and pass from one host to another and if it is intact then it will start replicating so originally people were thinking that because of the summer we will get less infection of corona virus but if you see the infection cycle the last six point the then the if they are from the surface the infection is less because of the heat we say but from human to human and from your touch from any other thing from one person again you are you are not audible madam you are not audible transmission mode is inhibited you are not audible again at your end there is uh, maybe some maybe some unstable i can see unstable internet uh, again i am repeating if i am audible now yeah no yeah. no you yeah, yeah. so i am just saying that dna and the dna rna and the protein these are the component of the virus they are affected by temperature or any chemical agent as in any other cell but uh, in, in the infection cycle they are uh, uh, if there is a possibility of transmission available then there is no effect of temperature from human to human it will go in winter it will go in summer but from surface to human you can reduce it when it is higher temperatures okay uh, the next question is how viruses identify the host cell for infection and also how do they identify the specific cell in which they infect like if there is an eye flu they will only infect eye how that is how that specificity is achieved and the concurrent one is how do they move if they move systematically from one cell to another cell okay. throughout the host yeah another good question so uh, as i showed you in one of the figure uh, all the first of all uh, there is a host specificity of the virus i will take example of plant virus the tomato leaf curl virus do not go to potato so why they have a host specificity they can identify the cell and enter into the cell in a particular host they will try in potato also but they cannot enter so they, the potato cannot be infected similarly you have seen in the corona virus there are receptors present on the cell and they need particular sequence that sequence compel if they are complement to each other that amino acid sequence they act like a key to open a lock so if those receptor binding at the cell surfaces their virus can identify okay this is the right type of cell i have to enter into this but if that key opening is not there virus cannot enter 
So there is a specific mechanism between the viral receptors and the host cell receptors. When they match with each other, they will infect. Coming to the how they move, once they are moving and looking for these cells, whenever they will get these cells, they will infect. If they don't get these cells, they are looking for these cells. So certain organs, whatever conjectivitis you are seeing in your eye is a symptom which you are seeing. But it does not mean that it is only confined to those areas of infection. Maybe infection is occurring somewhere else also near to that region. But the outcome you can see as a redness in your eye. So in, in plants also, whenever you see a leaf curl symptom, you feel it is full of virus. But generally, the viral, viral load is very much low in those leaves. And the young emerging leaves, which are not showing any symptoms, are full of viruses. So these symptoms are just the repercussions of the malfunctioning of the host cell. It does not necessarily mean that... Again, why is lost? We can't hear you. Madam, we can't hear you. <laughs> you are inaudible. Hello? Yes, yes. I don't know. It's another, in my everything looks okay. No, we, so, we, shall, we, shall I repeat, repeat the answer? Last or part. They are Perhaps the last part. Uh, I don't know. Maybe I don't know from where I have to start okay. again, but just <laughs> I'm saying. Any of which will move further. Uh, okay. Did, did, did I ask you whether uh, are DNA viruses more pathogenic or RNA viruses? There is no such relationship. They can be oh, both. Yeah. You know, both uh, there is no direct relationship of pathogenicity. Okay. The genomic yeah. How viruses remain dormant for a long time but reappear at some time like herpes or HIV? Good. Very good question. Uh, it's uh, Viruses, I, I want to say that viruses never die. They have to live in host. And if, uh, if like we will develop vaccine today and uh, tomorrow we will be uh, get rid of coronavirus, it won't happen. It will jump to another species and survive in that species for a longer time and mutate accordingly. And whenever the time comes, it will again jump to you. So viruses will remain there, whether in plant or in human system. They change their species. Like in uh, plants also, they go to the various other plant species like weeds. They stay in weeds doing no harm to the weeds, just propagate, and then again they can jump to the crop plants. Similarly, they jump to the animal species. Okay. Uh, why reverse transcription occurs, which is actually a waste, wasteful process? Why should we have re reverse transcription? <laughs> and do RNA viruses invariably have reverse transcriptase? Two pair of questions. A pair of sir, questions. Sir, sorry, first part I'm not able to hear. Uh, do RNA viruses invariably have reverse transcriptase? Is the one question. Yes. And a related one is why reverse transcription process? Because it's a actually wasteful procedure uh, or step. Mm -hmm. Why not have straight away a, mm -hmm. the plus strand? In other words. Good. Good. Very again, very breaking. Why is breaking? Transcriptase, they do not. Uh, uh, I do not know what is the problem. Uh, now you can hear. Yeah, yeah, fine. Yes. So reverse transcript viruses do not carry reverse transcriptase with them. They want to take the reverse transcription process of the host cell. And once you say it is a useless process or an energy loss process, uh, Dr. Bhatt initially mentioned about transposons, retro transposons. So in our normal cell system machinery, there is a control of gene expression by using retro transposons. 
So retrotransposons are nothing but first converted to RNA and then again converted back to DNA. And that is where the reverse transcription machinery is required. So it is a cell expression regulatory machinery, not a wasteful process. It is required to uh, control your cell ex gene expression. So that gene expression control is there. And that is how viruses which want to use this reverse transcriptase for this purpose they want to use this machinery of the host. Okay. Uh, repeatedly, the question is coming. If the viruses are not living outside the body, uh, how do they die? Uh, if, if, and if so, how can they be inactivated? And also, we can take this, although it falls into the other the coronavirus. If the a virus does not survive outside the body, then why the fear of handling the dead body of COVID patients? Uh, patients? Good, good. Again, I'm very happy to the, uh, get these questions. Uh, the point is uh, how they die. If you see the biochemistry, they consist of only two components, DNA and coat, coat protein. Basic thing, two things. So any mechanism by which you can destroy these two things, they will die. So first thing we are saying, uh, wash your hands with soap. So by using soap at higher pH, you are dissolving the lipoprotein. So that is how the uh, virus dies. The second people are using UV, UV lamp to denature the genomic components. So that is how the virus dies. So these are the uh, mechanical ways by which you can disturb these two components and other all other mechanism is just to prevent transmission the, these two are the process by which you can kill the virus okay uh, has life if life has arisen from virus is it happening now <laughs> the last question in my slide is whether the virus and host co-evolve no so, no not not co evolve mm -hmm. a new life yes. arising a yes. new from so virus. these viruses are also evolving from the genome of the no, host. No, no, evolution is not evolution is a life continuing. Yeah. Whereas, whereas if the life has arisen from virus, are there some some this one as in the primordial soup? The, uh, is it happening now? It is like some children asking. Okay. If okay. if a man has come from monkeys, mm -hmm. are some monkeys <laughs> now becoming humans? <laughs> yeah, same, same way. The same way you can answer that still it is not very clear that how the viruses evolved initially. There are some thoughts that maybe from the host, uh, some part of the genome of the different host were encapsulated into different proteins and make a tiny organism which can re replicate once again. It is like still it is not very uh, clear to clear to answer at the moment. And as sir mentioned that uh, still the viruses are coming and evolving within themselves. They are evolving, but whether they will come rise to another species. I, have, I cannot imagine at the moment. Uh, coming back to the plants, can virus-infected plants be rescued by spraying? Okay. Is there any cure? Okay. As you all know that there is no medicine of viral infections in human. Same way there is no medicine or spray for viral infection in plants. The only spray we... Because in every viral case, I, I mentioned about how they are transmitted. For example, they are transmitted by insects, sometimes white fly, aphids. So we can only spray to kill those transmission mode. But once the virus is inside the host, if you are killing something, you are killing the host cell also. So it is not possible. There is no viricide available both for human, animal, and plant system. Only way is to cut down the transmission. So spray will just help You are not audible again. Missing. Hello. Uh, 
now now you are okay yeah yeah last, last yeah. sentence is that yeah. yeah just i am telling you that uh, there is no virus site available fine no, no virus can be killed whether in human or in uh, plants the only thing you can use is to spray to kill the insect which transmit this virus from one plant to another plant but if the plant is already infected with virus if you spray it won't help okay uh, you mentioned that the sometimes the young leaves we do not show symptom carry high viral load uh, one question is how is it that meristem culture you know going back to tissue culture uh, how do we get virus free plants okay whenever we go for the in vitro propagation of uh, cultures through tissue culture virus free material is the first most important priority for us because if you start with the viral infected material it will propagate it again break break off the first step is what hello okay carry hello. on uh, it is audible uh, yeah, yeah like in case of banana tissue culture the first priority was to take the select the mother culture test for virus infection and will be transmitted hello yes but uh, iska answer aap hi de dijiye wahan pe audio audio problem hai ha ha audio problem hai lagta hai nahi ab abhi aapko sun raha hai ha aa raha hai beech beech mein kat jata hai so <laughs> i do not know jab tak maybe i will switch off my camera so that uh, maybe the signal improves Yeah. Uh, let me like this uh. because there has been throughout your lecture uh, brief uh, mm -hmm. interventions uh, mm -hmm. if you can repeat the answer uh, answer for uh, meristem culture meristem culture yes so virus uh, once it is in the plant part and you you want to regenerate through micro propagation techniques virus will replicate there so that is how in all the tissue culture procedures like in the propagate in vitro uh, propagation of banana the virus free planting material is very very important to start with so it is very important you cannot uh, take the risk of taking virus infection and during propagation through tissue culture it will go to different cells uh, maybe i can answer this uh, yes uh, see one can cure a plant infected with virus through meristem culture which is given in your book uh, why it is possible to do so i will again go back to the start in the beginning i mentioned wendley stanley a uh, wendley stanley's assistant was uh, white uh, all the teachers would be knowing about tissue culture the continuous tissue culture uh, system plant tissue culture system was established by white p r white uh, he was asked to maintain the virus for stanley and in his notebook he said that you have to maintain a large piece of tissue to maintain the virus if you take the meristems the virus is lost so the implication was not immediately apparent to him what happens is in the meristem there are no plasmodes metal contacts virus is normally move through this plasmodes meta and that is why meristem is generally free from viruses so if you can isolate the meristem and do the culture you will get virus free plants that is so one can get rid of the virus through tissue culture by meristem culture uh, i hope uh, i am clear now yeah thank you thank you dr bhat for adding because this is the i i am not able to connect to minister minister culture yeah. okay and now we will come back to some more questions uh, i think we have time and there are lots of people still <laughs> watching so i sure. will take more questions um, these are about immunity although mm -hmm. some of this might fall into the afternoon part but we can certainly take Uh, what's the role of interferon in virus infection mm -hmm. uh, 
how virus is compromised host immune system mm -hmm. and what's the role of this chavan prash and all this in improving our immunity okay so first before giving you the answer i am just putting my disclaimer i am not a Oh, you are again, again, again problem, madam. Sorry, we cannot hear anything. Nothing is audible at my end. Uh, is it so, Dr. Dr. Srinivasan? Yeah. Hello. Yeah, she is not audible. Yeah. Now, now it is okay. Now yeah. It is okay. Now it is okay. On and off. 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 the immune response of a body is dependent upon the immune immunological setup of your body and how active your uh, that is why we say uh, the age matters in immune response or if you have any uh, diseases your immune response is compromised then you have a difficulty in battling with this virus so immunity and immune immune response you will hear in detail at 230 talk Uh, so i am not going into the detail coming to chavan prash and various ayurvedic thing which we are hearing every day and we are also practicing the purpose is that how by eating good this is the basic principle of a biochemistry that what you are what you eat so what you because you all know the metabolism there is a catabolism and an anabolism your body cannot make anything unless you provide from outside so what you eat it is catabolized giving you a basic molecules and then these basic molecules reassemble to make you different proteins so antibodies are nothing but the proteins so if your uh, your diets are still poor or poor from many years that protein rich diet is not there maybe it affects your immune response so again i am saying i am not a medical virologist so i cannot comment directly but as a biochemist i can say that if your diet is not proper and lacking in in essential components then your immune response is weak secondly yeah. if you are not exposed to different uh, infections in your early if you are too protective it is also said that if you are too protective and your immune response has not got a chance to work that time also you feel that you are more susceptible to diseases okay uh, there is one other question uh, i think uh, many questions pertaining to corona uh, we will not uh, be able to entertain because they fall outside the uh, specialty yeah. uh, and there will be lot of you know such questions uh, daily on the tv and various other media uh, one final question which is in the minds of almost everybody uh, how to sanitize vegetables Uh, from virus particularly corona yeah uh, it's a daily new uh, in news also uh, in, at 2 o'clock there is a show coming and their doctors are coming and they are giving you advice uh, i can only say that we have to neutralize the lipoprotein the capsid of the virus if you want to get rid of virus so people are coming with the uv lamp uv lamp can destroy the genetic material but that is not possible in everybody's home but for uh, daily thing you can use uh, this baking soda uh, sodium bicarbonate in water or hot water and you dip it but some of the videos which i saw they say that uh, fruit or vegetable skin is like your skin so you can use the mild soap also which cannot directly penetrate into the skin but if you are using milder soap solutions in a hot water and dip your vegetables for 
say five, seven minutes, then the capsid protein will be neutralized. So these are the two ways people are using it. And I am using a light soap, a soap solution in my house to neutralize the virus in, on vegetables and fruits. Uh, you mentioned about hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. Uh, somebody wanted some bit of clarification. Maybe they missed the transmission at that time when oh. you were speaking. Okay. HCQ directly is not any medicine for viral infection, first of all. Whenever you are taking HCQ, uh, hydroxychloroquine, then around the cell, the pH variation around the cell is, uh, is much higher, which prevents the entry of the virus through viral receptors, uh, this host receptors. That is what the point given. But nobody has proved this by some, uh, only the clue, because this virus is only four months old, four or five months old. So we do not know how actually it enters, but definitely for doctors or frontline workers who are daily in touch with those patients, this is working as a preventive step for them. But exact mechanism is they are just changing some cellular, extracellular conditions to prevent the entry of the virus through uh, that receptors. That is what I got. Okay. I think uh, that summarizes the set of questions uh, for the morning session. Uh, you can at least, yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I thank you for an outstanding presentation and which is also evident from the Lots of the lots of questions that we had, very interesting questions. Uh, I think uh, most of them are satisfied. And if you still have more curiosity, the afternoon lecture is about immunology and immunity. Uh, whatever further questions uh, from this session, which was pertaining to that, I shifted to that because once that lecture is given, many things will become automatically clear. Uh, I really profusely thank you, Madam, for this uh, excellent presentation, uh, covering the entire breadth of viruses, both animal and plants. How do they move? How do they infect? Uh, I think uh, everybody is very happy with this, as I see from the chat. Uh, so once again, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any final words. Uh... It's my pleasure, Dr. Bhatt. Pleasure to be here and to share some of the insight about viral infection and whatever we did in the laboratory. And I'm really very much glad to get the questions from you. That is very important. Your lecture is because we all are in virtual mode of presentation and we are not able to see our audience. And the only way by which I can say that you are able to understand my lecture is by your questions. So I am really very delighted that uh, so many queries and so many thought process has started um, after listening to this lecture. And that gives me a lot of encouragement to go work in this area. Thank you very much, Dr. Pat, and all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Uh, I have one announcement for all the participants. Uh, we have circulated the Excel sheet for filling up the details. Uh, if someone is yet to do it, please do so, giving all particulars uh, as relevant so that we can prepare the certificates for posting it to you. Uh, with that, I thank again, once, once again, uh, Dr. Shelley for the lecture and also say that if anybody has any queries in the future also, uh, her email is available, genetic trust email is available for continuous interaction in the future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we close the session here and again meet in the afternoon at 2.30. Thank you. Okay.